Junia, and along with her today, Phoebe and Priscilla. But let's start with Junia, because honestly, what's the big deal here? Why are we talking about a woman who gets one sentence in one book? I mean, can we really stretch that out into a sermon? And of course, if you've heard enough sermons around here, you absolutely do know that yes, we can stretch one sentence into a whole sermon. But the reason we find ourselves focused on Junia this week is because she has not gotten her due for a good chunk of Christian history. And my son turned nine yesterday. And if you have a nine-year-old anywhere near your home, you know what a big deal birthdays are at this age. For two weeks now, I have gotten a daily countdown of how many days are left until his birthday. In fact, a couple days ago, I woke up, I came downstairs, and the first thing I was greeted with was, hey, dad, for my birthday, not the one in two days, but the one next year, I was thinking about a few things, and I'd like to run them by you. And I was like, slow your roll here. Let's get to nine first before we worry about double digits. Point is, my son was not going to let credit for surviving nine years on this planet slip by. He got his party. I think Junia deserves hers. So here we go. Today, we're going to talk about prison stories, what's a name, deacons, co-workers, and apostles. And we'll come back to look at a slightly larger section of text a little later. But I want to start with the one line that Junia gets, and it comes to us from Romans 16, 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was, says Paul. Now, Andronicus and Junia. From the phrasing here, we would assume that these two are either a brother and sister or more likely a husband and wife, but they are clearly a pair, and from what follows, an equally committed pair, both of them ending up in jail at one point. But from this one line, we already know a few things about them. Paul says, they have been in Christ longer than he has been, which means they must have been part of that very early Jesus community. And unsurprisingly then, we also learn that they are Jewish, That makes sense. After all, it was Paul who largely took the Jesus story into the non-Jewish communities. And so the earliest followers of the way, even those before Paul, would have been largely almost entirely Jewish. What's interesting, though, is that neither of these names are Jewish names. Andronicus is Greek, and Junia is Latin. Now, Andronicus was a very common name that was given to freed slaves, Junia was a name that was often taken by slaves to curry favor. Because Junia came from a very well-known and well-regarded Roman family name, Jens Ulius, where we get Julius Caesar from. Now, we have very little to go on here, but there is at least some compelling suggestion that this couple were Hebrew people who had found themselves in slavery in Rome, who had bought their freedom back for themselves and who had then risked it all for the story of Jesus to find themselves back in prison like Paul. And if that's the case, and if he knows that story, no wonder Paul is so impressed by these people and their commitment to good news. Often, I think we smite, fight for some small measure of freedom in our lives, and sometimes that struggle can actually make us more timid and more fearful about what comes next. After all, if we found some small victory, we've got to hang on and we've got to fight to protect it, right? I mean, I get that. I, I do. I feel that at times as well. But at the same time, I also know that the people I've met who have moved through the largest change in their life, and had the biggest growth and the most profoundly difficult stories of transformation that they've overcome, often in my experience, those are some of the most fearless in their advocacy for what is right and what's around them. And so when I read this, I wonder if maybe the fact that Andronicus and Junia had experienced the injustice of the Roman world is actually what motivated them to work, whatever the cost, for a new kind of kingdom and society. Regardless, we do know that they supported Paul, they worked with Paul, and they were even in prison with Paul at some point. Now, we know some of, if not all, of Paul's prison stories, and these two don't show up there. 
So it could be that Andronicus and Junia are alongside Paul in one of those prisons but are just unmentioned. That's possible. It could be that they were alongside Paul in another imprisonment story that we don't know about. Uh, We have some gaps in his life, so that's also possible. Or it could be that they were imprisoned for the gospel separately, but Paul is speaking about them in a more collegial way. As in, you and I, we are in this together because we have a unique shared experience. It's really Paul saying something more like, look, you, you two get me in a way that others can't, and that means a lot to me. I think, I think we all know what it's like to find someone who's been through something that we have, that thing that we really struggle to put into words for someone else. And those relationships mean a lot for us. It seems like they did for Paul as well. And obviously, we don't know exactly for sure what's going on, but it's likely that it's that third possibility here, specifically because of the language that Paul uses. He uses the term here, sunek malatos. That's what's being translated by the phrase, have been in prison with me. But more literally, what that means is fellow prisoner. And the trick here is that this is not a word that refers to someone who's been thrown in jail. That was actually pretty frowned upon in the ancient world. Unsurprisingly, no one wants to go to jail. But sunek malatos, that's actually a term that carried a lot of dignity and honor with it because it referred to a prisoner of war. So it gave the idea of having been imprisoned for your commitment and your country and your flag and all those patriotic ideals we might ascribe to today. But it actually lines up well with other places where Paul says things like, look, you're not a citizen of Rome anymore. Canada doesn't take precedence for you as a follower of Jesus. You are a citizen of heaven, part of God's kingdom. That's where your allegiance now lies. So to be referred to as a sunek malatos doesn't just mean cellmate. It speaks to the shared commitment and purpose and citizenship that Paul has with them. It doesn't mean we happened to be in jail together. It means I see you as a partner and equal, a citizen with me. And that's important because Paul also refers to Andronicus and Junia as outstanding or well-known among the apostles. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well-known among the apostles. Does that mean they were well-known to the apostles, as in the apostles knew them well? Or does it mean of all of the apostles, these two were very well-known? Well, know this, it's the second. Uh, Truth is, there is debate about this, but it is largely ideological, not philological. And what I mean by that is this. The Greek here can technically be read either way, but pretty much everyone agrees that outstanding among the apostles is the most straightforward way to read this sentence. Well-known to the apostles is possible, but you need to make an argument for why to interpret it that way. And the only real argument here is because a woman could not possibly have been an apostle. Therefore, Paul must have meant something other than the normal reading of what he wrote. And I'm not even stretching things here. That is the argument that is made for why we should take a secondary interpretation here. Paul says other things about other women in other letters to other cities. Therefore, he can't mean what he seems to be saying here. In fact, translators for the ESV which is notorious for stretching words into their most gender-specific options possible. They use the phrase well-known to the apostles, but then they go even further and they add a footnote that says, actually, apostle can just mean messenger, so that's likely. And that's true. That is all that the word means. The irony is if you reduce apostle from a title to just the word messenger, then you don't need to find a way to make sure that Junia wasn't one of them. You can just leave it as it says. However... The real indignation here is not from modern translations. It actually goes back much, much farther. Because the earliest attempts to constrain Junia appear to have taken hold somewhere in the 6th century. Back then, the tact was not to deny her outstanding position among the apostles. Everyone accepted what Paul said. The strategy then was to make her a man. Now, to get into the weeds here a little bit, 
The text actually reads Iunion or Junion, and that N on the end signifies the accusative case. It's just part of Greek grammar, but it tells us she is the subject of the sentence. And the question is whether that N is a normal suffix stuck onto the end of her name, Junia becoming Junion, or whether it replaces an S, which would indicate a masculine form, Junias becoming Junion. In fact, Andronicus is pronounced Andronicon in this sentence for that same reason. So there you go, perfectly reasonable assumption, Junia is a dude named Junias. One problem though, Junias is not a name. Uh, Junia appears in biblical texts and has been found in more than 250 inscriptions. It was a very common woman's name. Junias appears. Anyone want to take a wild guess here? Never. <laughs> Not in any book or any note or any letter or any inscription we have ever found. It doesn't appear because it just wasn't a Latin name. It is a made-up, theoretically masculine version of the name Junia. In fact, John Chrysostom one of the very early church fathers, writes in the mid-300s, and he says, to be an apostle is something great. To be outstanding among the apostles, just think. What a wonderful song of praise that is. They were outstanding on the basis of their works and virtuous teachings. Indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been, for she was deemed worthy of that title. I mean, the dude cannot believe that a woman would have been worthy of this, but there it is. Paul vouches for her, and that's good enough for old John. And yet, in the 6th century, we have one manuscript that adds an accent indicating Junias to be the reading, and then five centuries later, we get one more that does the same. And on the basis of that, Two manuscripts against all the others that suggest Junia and had for centuries, it was American translators in the 19th century that decided these two relatively late manuscripts, they're designated B2 and D2, they should overrule all of the other manuscripts, and her name was officially changed to Junias in English, erasing the only female apostle ever mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. Now, is it true that Junia was an outlier? Yeah. Just like Deborah, women that rose through male-dominated societies to be recognized as leaders at the absolute highest levels were rare. But you know what made it more rare? When we purposely hid the stories of those who broke through those barriers, empowered by God and recognized by community because they made us feel a little uncomfortable. And this is where I want to go back and pick up from earlier in Romans chapter 16. See, Junia appears in a larger section where Paul is recounting the many people in the Roman church who have supported and encouraged him over the years. And it's at this point in the letter that he's actually done all of his teaching. He has said everything he wants to say, and so he just wraps up with a series of greetings and thank yous. He says, starting in chapter 16, verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon in the church of Sancria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Now, deacon comes from the Greek word diakonos. Later, it becomes a designation in the church for the servant leaders that guide the community. And here, Phoebe is the first person, man or woman, who is given this title in Scripture. Next verse. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, we know from the book of Acts. Aquila is a Jewish man. Priscilla, or Prissa, we're not entirely sure about her background, but she looks like she was a Gentile. And that means that this is a mixed marriage at a time when Jewish and Gentile Christians were still figuring out how to get along with each other, which might have been why they were so influential in the early Jesus movement. They were modeling for us what we could become together. More than that, though, these two, they go to Ephesus with Paul to start a new church, they coach Apollos, who becomes another church planter. 
It's likely that they were some of the first members of the church in Rome that Paul is writing to here, and Paul calls them sunergos, or co-workers. Now, that doesn't sound as fancy as deacon or apostle. I get it. It was never really adopted as a religious title, but there's two main ways you can use this word in Greek. You can use it in the dative case, in which case it means co-worker to me, someone who supports you like an assistant, or you can use it in the genitive case, which means a coworker of me or a coworker alongside me, which indicates a colleague or a relationship of mutuality. So two very different uses, but any guesses on which one Paul uses here? It's the latter, it's the genitive. It means that Paul sees Priscilla and Aquila as peers, not as subordinates. Next, Paul says, greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. And we have no idea who this Mary is. Other than that, she was clearly well enough known to the church here that she could just be name dropped and everyone would be like, yeah, we get it. Yeah, Mary's cool. <laughs> Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. They were in Christ before I was. Here's what I want you to notice today. Paul is done teaching at this point in the letter. He has no more agenda here. He's not trying to make a point or virtue signal. He's not trying to brush up his feminist bona fides. This is simply Paul thanking the people that meant the most to him. Phoebe, a woman, the first person named as a deacon in the church, Priscilla and Aquila, a couple of mixed ethnicity, where the woman is named first, by the way, colleagues of Paul. Mary, a woman who carries enough weight in community that everyone knows why she gets a shout out just from her name. And Andronicus and Junia, who are not only apostles, but outstanding among them, models to look up to for even the most well-regarded leaders. You see, what's fascinating about Junia What's fascinating about this final chapter of Romans is that this is a window into the actual leadership of the very early church. Men and the women who actually shaped the community that we now participate in together today. And yes, in the years and the centuries that would follow, there were all kinds of political machinations and power struggles and social pressures and name changes everything we saw in the attempts to erase Junia from our history. And yes, sadly, over time, the church, like a lot of organizations, slowly gave in to reflect the expectations that surrounded it in society. But here, in this glimpse back to the earliest moments, what we see is a community at its most vulnerable, a nascent movement that could not afford to conform to social expectation. And instead, simply allowed the Spirit to empower leaders as Jesus saw fit. See, Paul isn't trying to make a point here, and that's what makes it so powerful. This is an unvarnished look at who Jesus brought to the table when it was all getting started. And yes, as the church moved from the margins of society toward the center and eventually into places of power, it became easier and it became easier for us to choose leaders that looked like what everyone expected a leader to look like. And to our shame, we actually tried to rewrite our past to reflect those expectations that came from the societies around us. But the best stories have a way of hanging on, even when we sometimes want them gone. And I think that's because spirit knows that even in the shadow, we need to hold on to the stories of light that remind us of something bigger. You see, Junia is here to tell us that our place at the table is not only open to us, it is necessary for the body to flourish. And if you have ever felt like your story has been written over, or your contributions ignored, like your gifts and perspective and leadership have not been given the weight that they deserve, then know this, that Junia is cheering for you. 
and that Jesus sees you and that the Spirit is working through you right now in some way. Trusting that shadows will always give way to the light of Christ that is in you right now.